By the end of the 19th century, Victorian art and architecture had developed an easily recognizable and dominant visual style. But as the 20th century began and the First World War loomed, how would it survive in the new modern age? Part of the appeal of Victorian art lies in its innate sense of the tragic. So many of the paintings are about love, loss and death. As the 19th century drew to a close, European painters became more and more obsessed with the idea of women either in a kind of femme fatale situation, luring men to some kind of untimely depth, often in the sea, or the tragedy of women in another situation. And here, of course, we have arguably the most famous painting by J.W. Waterhouse. Now, J.W. Waterhouse is normally known for his nipple count. Waterhouse was very well known for painting pubescent girls and he showed lots and lots of nipples. This, however, is something very different. The Lady of Shalott is based on the romantic poet Alfred Tennyson's poem of 1832. In the poem, Tennyson describes the story of a woman who lives on the island of Shalott, upriver from King Arthur's Camelot. Deemed a fairy by a peasant who hears her singing, she has been cursed for reasons that neither she nor the reader understands not to look out of the window. Of course, she does. When a handsome knight, Lancelot, passes by, she cannot stop herself. The curse falls and she is forced to sail to Camelot, singing as she dies. I think in this, which is arguably his best picture, you really do see that the guy could paint. And that's the truth, he really could. And there's odd symbolism, the figure of Christ, which I've only seen since we got the painting lit today. I haven't seen it ever before. Most strange. And is it a rosary? I don't know. It sort of almost looks like Christ in bondage, and I can't be right. But this is a really, really great late 19th century painting. Maybe Waterhouse is the tip of the iceberg of a tradition that was getting a bit atrophied, but this picture is really, really the real thing. The idea of untimely death fascinated Victorian artists. Poets often got the worst of it. This is the young romantic poet, Thomas Chatterton, a writer of Gothic tales who killed himself with arsenic because he couldn't make ends meet. The painting is by Henry Wallace and carries on in the tradition of heroic martyrs dying in the cause of art. But with the onset of the First World War, the 20th century attitude to death changed radically and dramatically. Whilst there were still artists painting sleepy, unbloodied tales of chivalry, the rest of the world would go to war in the mud of the trenches. After the horrors of the First World War, Victorian painting, and particularly the late pre-Raphaelite followers, became anathema. Everybody thought they were totally irrelevant. Who really wanted to see damsels in distress? Who really wanted to know about the Victorian vision of Ophelia? But despite the fact that the pre-Raphaelites had become completely and totally unfashionable, and nobody wanted to know about them, it is quite surprising how many 20th century artists did still sneakingly admire them. And in fact, walking into an art gallery today, it's easy to forget how contemporary the pre-Raphaelites still feel.
Wow. <laughs> I'm in Southampton, and we're here to look at the Perseus series by Burne Jones. They're very interesting because, in many ways, they look incredibly modern. I mean, take, take this. It's pretty extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, yes, of course, the girl is a Burne Jones girl, but look at the rest of the picture, and the, again, the way he's making shapes all the time. Very, very, very dark, very dark images. Of course, here you've got something much more conventional. I mean, we, we know that. That's the Burne Jones everybody knows and loves. I mean, the girls, obviously, they're very idealised girls. Idealised beauty, of course. But then, on the other hand, you take this picture, which almost has a sort of cartoon quality about it, but look at the bloke. I mean, a Victorian full frontal nude. Well, the Victorians didn't really go for that, but Burne Jones brought the nude back, albeit in a kind of idealised way. But it's a pretty strong and pretty powerful image for the late 19th century. If we come down here, I think we find what I think is, is the best of the series, which, of course, is Perseus about to slay the sea serpent. And, I mean, look at the rhythm of this. I mean, there's the most fantastic rhythm in the swirls of the picture. And, of course, Burne Jones again with his idealised female nude, of course, untouchable, like girls tend to be if they look like that. Uh, but a fantastic, fantastic image, I think. Really, really powerful. And, again, just think of it, it it's pretty contemporary, isn't it? But for me, if you look at this and you say, wow, is that really, really a Victorian artist who comes from the Pre-Raphaelites? Answer, yes, but of course, Burne Jones went off in his completely different direction. This is the fall of Lucifer, which Burne Jones wanted to call Paradise Lost. And in my view, it's one of the most interesting pictures that I have, because it was originally designed for the American church in Rome, which, if you're in the Eternal City, is, in my view, one of the better places to go. It never was executed. It was never, never designed. It was, I suppose, going to be some kind of mosaic, but it never happened. And Burne Jones kept it in his studio and was very, very fond of it. He kept saying to his wife that nobody understood it and nobody appreciated it. And I wonder if, without it sounding a bit pretentious, whether or not it's really because he's experimenting with a kind of two-dimensional cubism. It's a very, very remarkable piece. I mean, you do get the feeling that Burne Jones is trying to move well away from the Victorian art that he's probably best known for. And I think that the extraordinary thing about it is how modern it is. During the time we've been making this program, it's given me an opportunity to think again about the Pre-Raphaelites. I've seen a lot of pictures and old friends that I haven't seen for years, and I've been to places that my day job doesn't allow me to get to very often. I've been thinking, therefore, about what is it that makes the Pre-Raphaelites so special, particularly to the British. If you think about it, they painted subjects that came from our most famous authors, such as Shakespeare or Tennyson. They painted our landscapes, but they also painted contemporary subjects, such as prostitution, as we've seen. And I think there's something about them that makes them incredibly relevant for today for exactly that reason. They weren't afraid to lay their emotion on a sleeve. No, of course they weren't. And some may find that sentimental, particularly in the later paintings. But what they really, really did have was a passion to change in their own way. And I don't believe they're a footnote to art. I think they're the part of the mainstream, but a very British mainstream. Come on over, baby. Whole lot of going on. And I'm going to make a bet with you. As we're all living longer now, or at least you lot probably are, in a hundred years' time, I bet you the Pre-Raphaelites will be around when diamond-encrusted skulls have been consigned to the attic just like the Pre-Raphaelites were 90 years ago. Just a little bit. That's what you got. Yeah. 
and find out more about the making of the Perspectives films with exclusive interviews with the directors at itv.com slash perspectives. Following 10 interns at the prestigious London School of Surgery who are training to become consultant surgeons, it's next tonight. Oh, Lord, shake it.